Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, I have with me Janet Benj. Janet is the author of Christian Heroes Now and Then, the series. There are 79 of these books. They just told me they were working on their 80th. You can read these in multiple sunlight packages. Um, our history Bible literature packages have clearly have quite a few of um, Janet and Jeff Benj's books. I'm so excited Janet is here with me today. Today, Janet is going to share with us one of her um, missionary stories, and she's going to read a little bit from that book. I'm going to let her introduce it, but again, this would count towards your child's, um, the Read for Missions hours. So you are learning about Christian missionaries and Christian growth here in this. So if you'd like, you can pause this right now and go grab your children and let them learn about you. Who are you reading about, Amy? Is it Amy? Um, I'm Lillian Treasure. Lillian Treasure, yes. So uh, with that, I would like Janet to introduce a little bit about the author and um, go ahead and start reading. Or I'm sorry, not the author, the, the person you're writing about. You're the author. Okay. I am the author, yes. Hi. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here. Uh, just to let you know that most of uh, these books are also um, on audiobooks. And so if you want to hear them read professionally, uh, you can go there because, uh, and also my accent is from New Zealand because I don't want everyone to be spending their time thinking, where is she from? Is she Af South African or Australian? So no, I'm from New Zealand, but I live in, in Orlando, Florida and have lived here for many years. So have a bit of a mishmash. Um, I'm going to read to you from Lillian Treasure, and it's called The Greatest Wonder in Egypt. And if you wonder why I've chopped the corner off, it's because when we get our books, uh, we love to give them away, and then we don't have them when we need them. So the only solution we could find was to just chop a corner off it, and then it's, you can't give it to anyone. It's not a... <laughs> so then that becomes our book. So all of the books behind us that you see have got the corner chopped off them and they are permanently ours. So Lillian is an amazing lady. Um, she is from uh, the American South. She's born in 1887 and um, she comes from a moderately Christian home. She has one sister, Jenny, who is 10 years older than her. And she's a very good artist. She wants to make her living uh, as an artist for a newspaper. And so she kind of um, grows up and is um, uh, out on her own in about just after the turn of the century, uh, in about 1905. And she thinks she'll make her way as, uh, as an illustrator. Um, she's very tall, she's six foot tall. And um, she's pretty much been drawing her whole life and this is, was what she thought she would do. Um, she is on a train to go to an interview in Georgia for her, um, for her drawing. And she meets a lady who runs an orphanage and it's a very brief meeting, but it changes her life. Lillian ends up going to help her at the orphanage and then she ends up in Egypt. Um, and so she's in Egypt now in about 1917 with her sister. And uh, she doesn't have formal missionary training and she is um, a single woman. And so she goes and stays in a um, mission center where there's uh, a chief missionary and then uh, all the single women live there because um, it's not really very safe for single women to live alone. So this is chapter six, it's called Farida. And this is basically the beginning of Lillian's uh, own kind of mission that makes her famous. Um, and when Lillian dies, she has cared for uh, over 10,000 orphan children in Egypt. And the president of Egypt calls her the greatest wonder in Egypt. Um, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary what she achieves, but this is how it starts out. The way was unfamiliar and Lillian stumbled over rocks and bushes as she carried the baby back to the mission house. She walked much slower than Camille and Sila, and it was a full hour before Lillian slipped through the back door of the mission and tiptoed to the room she shared with Jenny. They were back, Camilla and Sila are back already and they told me you had a baby, Jenny said. Let's take a look. Lillian walked over and showed Jenny the baby. 
We have to get those clothes off her and bathe her, the poor little thing, Lillian said as she eyed the baby's filthy clothes in full light for the first time. Look, they've sewed her into them. No wonder she smells so bad. There's no way to change her diaper. Jenny moved towards the door. I already have some milk. I'll warm it on the kerosene heater while you undress her. I also got a pile of clean rags from the cleaning cupboard. They should make good diapers for now. Lillian spread out one of the rags on her bedspread and laid the baby down. And then very carefully, she began to cut the gown off the baby. As she worked, she hummed the chorus of a hymn. She was determined that the baby would not see her recoil with disgust as she wiped its little bottom. The baby's little bones reminded Lillian of a chicken. Sila knocked quietly and entered the room. She smiled at Lillian and gathered up an old sheet cut from it and cut from it a pattern of a simple baby gown. She sat down beside the mantel lamp and started to sew the pieces of the gown together. Lillian gave her a grateful look just as Jenny returned with some warm milk and a bucket of warm water. Lillian held the baby over the bucket and gently sponged her body. The child let out a loud wail, the volume of which surprised Lillian. Hush, hush, she crooned. You'll have milk in a minute. The baby took some, t the bath took some time and Lillian was not altogether pleased with the results. Although the baby's hair was now unmatted and the filth was gone from her body, she still smelled terrible. Lillian decided that the smell was rotting flesh and she determined to keep the wounds clean and give the baby plenty of fresh air and sunshine. Soon Lillian was feeding her new child one eyedropper of milk at a time. She remembered all the little orphans she had fed at the orphanage in North Carolina and she was grateful for the experience, though none of the children had been starving like this little frail baby was. Even in her child care, with her childcare experience, Lillian was unable to coax much milk into the baby's mouth and even less down her throat. The baby cried for most of the night, stopping only when she was so exhausted she fell asleep for a few minutes. At every opportunity, Lillian dropped milk into her tiny mouth and massaged her throat so that she would swallow it. Lillian was concerned that the crying would keep the other missionaries in the house awake as the walls were paper thin, but there was nothing she could do about it. She was already doing all she knew how to keep the baby calm. Jenny hardly slept the night either. By breakfast time, the woman had decided on an Arabic name for the baby, Farida. Lillian and Jenny spent the entire day caring for Farida. They took turns attempting to feed her and sewing clothes for her. That night, the baby began crying constantly and the following morning, she looked thinner than ever. Lillian thought that Farida was going to die, but she would not give up. For the next 10 days, Lillian and Jenny's lives revolved around the baby. Every mouthful of milk swallowed was a victory and every minute of, meat, of sleep a relief. As the days rolled by, Lillian noticed that the other missionaries in the house were becoming more stressed out. They had bags under their eyes and yawned at the breakfast table. Several of them remarked that how, how little sleep, about how little the baby slept and how strong her lungs were. Finally, after Farida had clung to life for two weeks, the Reverend Brailsford asked Lillian one morning to come to his office. Lillian left Jenny or Farida and proceeded with a sense of dread. Mr. Brailsford invited Lillian to sit down and then got straight to the point. We've had a meeting and we all agree that this mission house is no place for a very sick baby. She cries all night and keeps us awake and then we don't have the energy to go along with our regular missionary activities during the day. He paused to look at Lillian and then he continued. I'm sorry, but she'll have to take her back. Lillian gasped. Back? Back? Where? She has no place to go. Her mother is dead, and I don't know who the old woman and the man were. I can't take her back. You have to, said Mr. Wellsford, at once. She cannot spend another night in this house. But back where? Lillian repeated. She knew she sounded stupid, but she could hardly grasp that the mission leader would want her to abandon the baby. Is there an orphanage she could go to? Lillian finally asked. Mr. Belsford shook his head. There is no such thing as an orphanage in Egypt. Just think how many children would be clamoring to get in if there was one. No, you will have to find some relative to take the baby. Lillian shuddered at the thought of the old woman who had been holding Farida when the mo baby's mother died and of her staring into the Nile. Surely the baby would end up there if she were returned to, to her. Lillian felt her eyes blurring with tears. She wanted to ask this missionary how he could turn a needy child away, but she held her tongue. It was no use challenging Mr. Bradsford's authority in the mission house. Instead, Lillian stood and walked to the door. Before she left, she turned and said, All right, you are asking me to take her back? I will take her back, and I will go with her. She watched as a frown spread over the reverend's face. 
alone, he spluttered. Lillian, if you had been here longer, you would realize that this is quite impossible. A lone American woman living in an Arabic world, you will be killed or you'll starve to death. By now, Lillian's own words had begun to give her courage and she knew she was doing the right thing. I won't be alone. I will have God with me, she retorted. I, um, Mr. Brailsford seemed lost for words. Finally, he stood up and looked Lillian in the eye. Very well, don't say I didn't warn you. If you leave this house with the baby, you leave without my permission. Go and do what you want, but if things go wrong, don't come back here begging for help. Lillian stood rooted to the spot for a moment. She could scarcely reconcile the harshness of Reverend Brailsford's speech with the man she had met in Washington DC the previous fall. Then she stumbled out the door. Lillian needed fresh air. She left the house and began walking down the dusty road. What have I done? She asked herself. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, it's just heart wrenching to imagine yeah. the decision that she is making. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear the rest of her story. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing that she would take that stand and what yeah. Happened, yeah, afterwards and how she ends up, you know, as a lone Christian uh, missionary, uh, American, um, that she ends up with really the undying admiration of the top leaders in Egypt is, is quite extraordinary and even more extraordinary that she saves so, so many babies and, and widows and uh, creates a, a Christian community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Janet, for um, oh. reading that with us. And I just want to say you can find that story and many others, if not on the Sunlight website, on YWAM Publishing's website. Thank you so much, Janet. You're welcome.